20-year-old Renee Blackmore was an Army private. She was stationed at Fort Benning in Georgia in April of 1980. She was last seen leaving her barracks. A month later, in May 1982, Renee's wallet and sweat were discovered beside a road a few miles from the Army post. Then in June, Renee's body was found on a logging road a few miles away. Investigators determined that someone fatally shot her. Despite an extensive investigation, it took a few decades for investigators to find the person responsible. Then in April 2022, investigators announced that 64-year-old Marcellus McCluster was arrested in connection to the case. He's already serving a life sentence for an unrelated slaying. Kimberly Schwartz, who is the assistant district attorney of the Chattanooga Judicial Search, had this to say. We know that she didn't get to celebrate her 21st birthday. We don't know who she might have loved or the relationships she might have built, what dreams she might have realized. All of those things got extinguished by a blast from a cheap shotgun, about two miles from the middle of nowhere down in South Chattanooga County 40 years ago. There is no expiration date on that kind of evil, Renee's mother, Donna Reitman, said in a statement that her daughter was a focused young woman who loved laughing and having fun with friends. I have lived these 40 years always feeling the pain her absence causes, Reitman said, and believing no one outside of her family and friends even cared. It is with a grateful heart that on March 28, 2022, this belief was shown to be untrue. Investigators haven't said what exactly led to the arrest, but said McCluster had always been a suspect. They just never had enough evidence. The investigation gained new life in 2020 when the Georgia Bureau of Investigation formed a cold case unit made up of retired agents. McCluster is currently awaiting trial. 79-year-old Lucia Hallgren lived in Galt, California in 1988. She was a recent widow, her husband Frank Hallgren passing away in October of 1987. Lucille and Frank lived in Gold for about 25 years after moving there from Ohio. They had two adult sons. On May 23, 1988, two of Lucille's friends became concerned. It had been a few days since they last saw her, and she didn't attend church the previous day. The two friends entered her residence through a partially sliding glass door. They then found her body and called the police. Lucia had visible injuries to her chest, and she appeared to have been assaulted. The autopsy confirmed that she had been stabbed and strangled. Investigators collected DNA evidence from the crime scene belonging to the person who took her life. It turned out that investigators would get all the evidence they needed to solve the case, but it would take more than 30 years for the available technology to make sure of it. Thanks to advances in technology, Investigators with the Sacramento County Crime Lab got a hit in 2020 when they analyzed the scrapings from Lucille's fingernails, as well as bodily fluid from the bedding at the scene. They identified Terry Leroy Bramble as the person responsible. His DNA was on file from a 1992 assault conviction in San Joaquin County. It was thanks to this separate case that officials managed to link him to Lucille's case. Bramble had been a longtime resident and transient of gold until he passed away due to natural causes in October of 2011. It was under a bridge at Highway 99, where he'd been living for five or six years. The police said they had no information on a motive. Bramble had not been on their radar as a potential suspect, but he is now. When asked if Bramble could be linked to other cases, gold police said they were canvassing cold cases in the region for possible links. Galt Police Chief Brian Kolonowski said, Our hearts go out to the Hallgren family, and although we're unable to bring Lucille back, we hope by identifying the suspect responsible it can provide some closure for the family. Many people have come forward talking about all the great memories they have of Lucille. One of her neighbors, Sean Jacob, said, Her husband passed away to Alzheimer's, but they were both kind, loving people, and they took in all the neighborhood kids. We were always welcome in their house for cookies and lemonade during the summertime, and I never heard a crossword come from her. She was just very super sweet. Lucille's son, Henry Hogram, said, Mom was my champion. I was the baby of the family, and I miss her to this very day. He is 78 years old, almost the same age his mother was when he lost her. 11-year-old Melissa and Trimley lived in Salem, New Hampshire in 1988. On September 11th of the same year, Melissa accompanied her mother and her mother's boyfriend to the Los House Social Club at 397 Andover Street in Lawrence, New Hampshire. While her mother and her boyfriend remained inside the club, 
Melissa played in the adjacent neighborhoods and was last seen by a railroad employee and a pizza delivery driver during the late afternoon hours. When Melissa did not return to the club, her mother got worried. That night, her mother and the boyfriend searched the entire area, but when they couldn't find Melissa, they reported her missing. Melissa's body was found the next day, left on the train tracks. She had been stabbed as well. Investigators collected evidence from the crime scene. They believe that the person who stabbed her was left-handed. In 2014, when investigators took another look at the case, they found usable DNA samples that belonged to the person who took her life. A DNA profile was created but did not match anyone in their database. It would still be a few more years for DNA technology to be advanced enough to identify the suspect. That time would finally come in 2022. 74-year-old Marvin McClendon Jr. was arrested at his home in Bremen, Alabama, on April 26th. He was taken to a jail in Massachusetts to face the charges against him. Prosecutors said that DNA evidence found in 2014 on Melissa led investigators to McClendon's family. They obtained DNA samples from some, including Marvin. He was the only left-handed family member, and as you'll remember, investigators long believed the left-handed person committed the crime. After some more DNA testing, it was confirmed that Marvin McClendon took the life of Melissa. He also had ties to Lawrence and a vein that looked like the one witnesses saw Melissa near on the day she disappeared. He frequented numerous establishments in Lawrence near the club where Melissa was last seen. He lived in Chelmsford, Massachusetts at the time and worked as a carpenter. McClendon is also a retired Massachusetts Department of Corrections officer. He worked for the department on three separate occasions from 1970 to 2002. When he retired in 2002, he moved to Alabama. A Lawrence District Court judge ordered McClendon to be held without bail. He'll have a dangerousness hearing on June 17, 2022. A dangerousness hearing is when the prosecution requests the judge to hold a defendant without bail for up to 120 days. If you lose a dangerousness hearing, you will be locked up in jail without being convicted of anything. It will not feel like you are still presumed innocent until proven guilty. Melissa's family released a statement expressing their relief that there has been an update in the case and frustration that some of the family are no longer alive to see justice served. This is what Danielle Root, one of Melissa's family members, had to say. We never thought that after 33 and a half years, we would finally see someone arrested and facing a judge. While we know there are many more steps, we are very confident that the district attorney's office will be just as vigilant in prosecuting this case as the detectives have been for all these years in finding Marvin McClendon. There have been so many emotions since the end of April when we were contacted about the arrest. They have gone from excitement to sadness to frustration and really all over the place. We are excited to see him in jail, but very sad. My aunt, grandfather, and other family members are no longer alive to see him facing justice. Our family looks forward to seeing this case go forward to the grand jury for indictment and then on to the superior court to see justice finally served. Melissa's friend, Sherry Cunningham, was in court for McClendon's arraignment and said this, I was 10 years old when this happened, so you imagine a person in your head and what they could look like and who they could be, and you look and see a frail old man. You took the life of an 11-year-old girl, and then you went on for another 33 years walking free, and where is she? In a grave? It is unclear whether the suspect and victim knew each other, but the odds are it was a crime of opportunity. There is no information leading investigators to believe McClendon was involved in any other crimes, but it is being investigated. Barbara Kahlo grew up in Toronto, Canada. She graduated from the University of Guelph's Veterinary College with her master's degree. Barbara then worked as a researcher for a few years before being hired by the federal government in 1992 as a meat inspector. She then moved to veterinary biologics and was promoted to the science branch to advise on animal health issues. Barbara was an avid gardener, bicyclist, art enthusiast, and bird watcher. She loved to travel and excelled in her career where she came across to colleagues as a brilliant adventurous go-getter. In 2005, at 45 years old, Barbara decided to see the desert wildfires bloom in Arizona. She left her home on March 25, 2005, traveled to Abbotsford, British Columbia, and then to Las Vegas, Nevada, where she rented a car on March 26. Barbara then drove to Yuma, Arizona, where she spent the day. 
She then drove to Lake Havasu City, Arizona, and checked into a motel called the Windsor Inn Motel on April 2nd. She used the room as a base for day trips. Barbara was last seen alive by staff at about 8.40 p.m. on April 4th. Thereafter, she called her mother, Bridget Hollow in Toronto, to say that she was planning to stay another day in Lake Havasu before driving to Las Vegas to fly home. Her body was found by housekeepers shortly before noon the next day on April 5th. An autopsy revealed that the cause was asphyxiation after being smothered by a pillow. No weapons were found in the room. Barbara's purse, credit cards, cell phone, identification, rental car, and the pillow were missing. The stolen car was found two days later abandoned along Interstate 15 in California's Mojave Desert. Investigators collected DNA belonging to the suspect from the crime scene and stored it for future use. At the time, Lake Havasu Police Lieutenant Joe Archie said it was believed that Barbara had confronted someone trying to break into a rental car. It's possible she knew the person, but most likely not, said Archie. We think it was just kind of a situation where she was in the wrong spot at the wrong time. In 2018, Lake Havasu's Police Department's Cold Case Squad and its Criminal Investigations Unit began reinvestigating the case. They submitted the DNA evidence found at the crime scene back in 2005 into DNA databases. Finally, they identified Stacy Child as the man responsible. He was arrested on April 26, 2022. He is a Santa California resident. Childs has a long history of run-ins with the law. Among the charges of which he was found guilty in California were a 2018 misdemeanor for threatening to injure someone, a felony conviction for receiving stolen property in 2012, a felony conviction for evading peace in 2005, and a felony conviction in 2004 for false imprisonment. On the latter two charges, he was sentenced to serve more than four and a half years in San Quentin State Prison. He has now been taken to a jail in Arizona and is awaiting trial. 42-year-old Stephanie Thompson lived in North Charleston, South Carolina in 1998. She had three children, Dylan, Holly, and Ricky Thompson. On December 21, 1998, Stephanie's body was found approximately 20 feet into a wooded area off Franchise Street in North Charleston. Her body was discovered by a hunter who was looking for a place to squirrel hunt. Investigators found her lying face up on the ground, and her clothing below her waist had been removed. Investigators collected DNA evidence belonging to the suspect from the crime scene. A witness came forward, saying that they saw Stephanie the previous evening with a man leaving a trailer on Franchise Street. The witness was able to provide a description of the man that led to a composite sketch. Investigators questioned a few suspects, but it didn't lead anywhere, and the case went cold for some time. Recently, the case was reopened. Investigators knew they had a good DNA sample. It was sent to a private genetic genealogy testing company. The results of that test narrowed the search field. Finally, they identified 43-year-old Charles Goodwin as the man responsible. The match was made on December 10, 2021. He was arrested in Greenville, South Carolina on March 28, 2022. His DNA was in their database because he had been arrested in an unrelated felony DUI case. Investigators did not say whether they believe Goodwin and Thompson knew each other. But the warrant also states that Goodwin provided false and misleading information about his involvement in the case during interviews. When investigators told Goodwin why he was being arrested, he just said, okay, as if he was expecting it. Goodwin was taken to Georgia County Sheriff's Office and is being held at the L.C. Knight Detention Center after a bond hearing during which a judge denied bond. 19-year-old Carl Nichols lived in Colorado Springs. Colorado in 2012. She was an aspiring model. On October 9, 2012, Carl left her home to go to Denver. She told her friends she was traveling for a photo shoot. When no one heard from Cara, her brother Terry Nichols reported her missing five days later on October 14. In the years since she disappeared, investigators had leads that spanned the US and Europe and issued dozens of search warrants. Recently, a key witness for investigators told them that a man by the name of Joel Hollendorf confessed to taking the life of Kara. According to the witness, Hollendorf and Kara met because she was advertising escort services. For an unknown reason, he decided to strangle her. Recently, Hollendorf's property in Black Forest, 
Colorado, was searched, and Carr's remains were found buried there. In February of 2022, Hollendorfer was arrested in connection to the case. Investigators have not yet revealed more information than that. His hearing will be on September 15, 2022. 35-year-old Joy Hibbs lived in Croydon, Pennsylvania, in 1991. She was married to Charlie Hibbs, and they had two children, Angie and David. On April 19, 1991, when 12-year-old David came home from school, he found the house ablaze. He ran for help, knowing that his mother was most likely inside. Firefighters found Joy's body in David's room. Initially, police believed she passed away in an accidental house fire. They found four gas burners on the kitchen stove that were turned on and ignited. When the autopsy was done, investigators determined that she was deceased before the fire was set. They discovered what was later found to be a computer cord wrapped around Joy's upper torso. The autopsy determined she had been stabbed five times, strangled, and badly beaten. The autopsy also showed an important detail. Joy Hibbs had smoked marijuana the morning of the fire. Investigators quickly concluded the fire was set to destroy evidence of the crime, and authorities said it was largely successful, as much of the forensic evidence police would hope to find was destroyed. The fire marshal found four areas where the fire started, and in at least one spot, accelerant was likely used. Without the forensic evidence, Bristol Township Police dug into Joy's life, creating a working timeline for when her life was taken and the arson. She left a paper trail showing her moves on the morning of the fire. She cashed her paycheck at a bank and went grocery shopping, which was her normal Friday routine. She then came home around 11 a.m., and a neighbor reported seeing her walking the family's new puppy named Major. Two people from the Ben Salem Baptist Church, where Joy attended Easter services, dropped by to talk about joining the congregation sometime after 11 a.m. They left before noon. It was shortly after 1 p.m. when David returned home from school to find the house on fire. Joy's wallet was later found in the cushions of the living room couch, but it was empty, though she had cast her check hours earlier. Her purse was found on the kitchen floor with its contents dumped out. This implied that robbery could be the motive, but it didn't quite make sense to investigators. Taking someone's life in such a vicious way and then setting the house on fire for just a few hundred dollars. Police interviewed her employer, friends, neighbors, and family, but found that everyone who knew her seemed to love the mom that grew up the youngest of nine children in Central Florida. She camped, hiked, fished, grew vegetables, and loved making fried okra. Since many crimes of this nature are usually committed by the spouse, Charlie Hibbs was, of course, looked into. There was no sign of trouble in their marriage. Joe and Charlie were high school sweethearts. They celebrated their 18th wedding anniversary less than a week before her life was ended. Charlie also had a solid alibi. He was on a job site in Philadelphia, something co-workers confirmed. The only thing out of the ordinary that day was a dark-colored Monte Carlo parked three feet from the curb near the Hibbs home. A neighbor who noticed the vehicle later reported it to police, telling them it was unusual for a car to be parked directly in front of the Hibbs home, which was at a T-intersection. Robert Atkins soon became a suspect in the case. He sold marijuana occasionally to Joy. He owned a Chevy Monte Carlo. As you remember, Joy smoked marijuana on the morning of the fire. With a car similar to his scene in front of her house, this likely meant Atkins was at the scene around the time of the crime. Investigators learned that Joy and Atkins had argued over the quality of the drug he sold her, and Atkins refused to refund the money. While investigators believed it was possible that Atkins was involved, they couldn't prove it. The case made the rounds around Bristol Township police detectives over the years until it was assigned to Bristol Township Detective Michael Slaughter in 2014. He dug into the reports and re-interviewed investigating officers and witnesses from 1991. Slaughter also determined that Robert Adkins and his then-wife April were persons of interest. When Slaughter had shown up for a surprise interview with April Adkins in 2014, she told him that Bristol Township Police had never interviewed her about her ex-husband. Despite his alibi that placed the couple together in the Poconos with their children the week of Joy's demise, April Adkins told Slaughter that she and her husband and children were in the Poconos that weekend, and when they returned, they heard about what happened to Joy. The Bristol Township detective interviewed Robert Adkins two days after he spoke with his ex-wife in 2014. During that interview, 
Robert Adkins admitted to being a confidential informant for the Bristol Township Police Department at the time of the crime, and that he had been a methamphetamine user and got the drug for other people, though he didn't consider himself a dealer. He also admitted to the dispute over poor quality marijuana with Joy but denied threatening her or her family. He just simply couldn't give Joy a refund, he told the detective. Atkins claimed he had left Bristol Township around noon the day of the fire for a week trip to the Poconos with his wife and children. He said he could provide an alibi too, telling Slaughter a lady, later described as a co-worker of his wife, could confirm his whereabouts in 1991. Atkins also said that Bristol Township police checked the hotel where he stayed in the Poconos, and that cleared him further. More than a year later, in a December 2015 interview with Slaughter, former Chief Tom Mills confirmed that in 1991, Atkins was a confidential informant for the police, purchasing methamphetamine and marijuana. Mills told Slaughter that he interviewed Atkins for the first time two days after the crime in 1991 when he was asked by Lieutenant to deliver a message to Atkins to contact police before his name came up in the investigation. Mills and Detective Al Ilag, who was Atkins's handler, went to Atkins's apartment, but he wouldn't let them inside. Mills said he noticed a dark-colored 70s vintage Monte Carlo in the apartment complex parking lot. In 2016, April Atkins showed up at the Bristol Township Police Station on a Sunday. She wanted to tell Slaughter, whose business cards she saved, what really happened the day Joy Hibbs lost her life. She said that day, her ex-husband showed up at the home covered in blood. He confessed he had stabbed someone and set the house on fire. He ordered her to call out of work and pack up their kids. The family fled to the Poconos for two days. April Atkins, who at the time shared a young child and baby with her husband, learned about Joy Hibbs only after the family returned. She told police, April Atkins said she didn't tell police what she knew when Slaughter first interviewed her in 2014 because she feared for her third and youngest child's safety because he lived with Robert Atkins at the time. Another five years would pass before Bucks County detectives would speak with Robert Atkinson's alleged alibi, a former co-worker of April Atkins who provided Robert Atkinson with what authorities now say was a fake alibi. The woman told investigators in 2021 that police interviewed her in June of 1991, three days after Robert Atkins shared her contact information with them. The woman told police she called the Atkins' home between 1 p.m. and 1.30 p.m. on April 19, 1991, and Robert Atkins answered the phone. In May of 2022, 56-year-old Robert Atkins was charged in connection to the case. He was arraigned by Judge Frank Parent Sr. in Bristol and ordered to the Bucks County Correctional Center without bail. The Bucks County District Attorney's Office held a news conference DA Matt Weintraub, saying it was a gratifying day when he could bring closure to the Hibbs family with an arrest. In a statement read on behalf of the family by Weintraub, Joy Hibbs was described as a sweet, charming Southern girl and a loving and devoted wife and mother. For 31 years, our family has been haunted by this tragic loss knowing, without a doubt, that Robert Atkinson was the perpetrator. The statement read, Our family has waited 31 years for justice to prevail. Authorities continue to investigate, and anyone with information should contact either Detective Hanks at 215-348-6056 or Sergeant Slaughter at 215-785-4040. On July 2, 1996, a man's body was found in a room at the Prince Marat Motel in Tallahassee, Florida. The man was 44-year-old James Bruner, and an autopsy determined that he had been asphyxiated. James was a laborer who worked odd jobs around town. Investigators collected DNA belonging to the suspect from the crime scene. In 1996, DNA technology was not advanced enough to identify the suspect, so the case went cold. In 2020, Tallahassee Police Department detectives reopened the case and used new forensic technology to analyze the DNA found at the original crime scene. Investigators developed leads with the help of the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and Parabon Nanolabs, a Virginia company that provides DNA phenotype services for police. Detectives eventually developed enough probable cause to arrest 71-year-old Alan Lefferts in connection to the case. His DNA matched the suspect's DNA found at the crime scene. Lefferts was picked up at his home in Jacksonville, Florida, with assistance from the Baker County Sheriff's Office. 
Tallahassee Police Department Deputy Chief Jason Larson said in a statement, Solving a case that occurred nearly 26 years ago speaks volumes to the dedication and great collaborative effort between our state and local law enforcement partners. Our detectives and forensic specialists work tirelessly every day to seek justice for victims and ensure those responsible for crimes are held accountable. We're hopeful this arrest will bring some level of closure to the victim's surviving loved ones. As Lefferts did not confess, we don't know why he took the life of James Bruner. 22-year-old Christopher Hervey lived in Santa Ana, California in 1996. His girlfriend, Jay Binning, also 22 years old, lived with him. At 3 a.m. on January 4, 1996, Jade called 911. She reported that a man had broken into their apartment and fatally stabbed Christopher. According to her, she suffered a minor injury to her right hand when she struggled with the intruder. A witness also told the police they saw a man running from the apartment building. Investigators discovered Christopher's body with multiple wounds to his chest. They couldn't find the weapon anywhere. Neighbors informed the police that they heard a loud argument taking place shortly before Christopher was stabbed, lasting for around 15 minutes. Investigators continued to work the case, but their leads went cold until an anonymous letter arrived in January 2020, implicating Benning in the case. A co-case detective believed there to be enough evidence after following up on the case and obtained a criminal complaint from the Orange County District Attorney's Office, together with a warrant for Benning's arrest. 48-year-old Jade Manda Benning, who now lives in Austin, Texas, was arrested on May 3, 2022, near her home after an investigation that involved forensics. Agents from the U.S. Marshals Lone Star Fugitive Task Force arrested her. Detectives from the Santa Ana Police Department were also present to witness Benning being apprehended. She has been extradited to California to face the charges and is being held on a $1 million bail. We don't know exactly what led to the arrest, but we do know that evidence against her includes something the police found when they executed search warrants in Austin, Texas, in June 2020. Benning is currently in Orange County Jail. Her arraignment is scheduled for June 8, 2022. Armand and Lorraine Palliter lived in Frenchville, Maine in 1985. It is a small town near the Canadian border. On December 7, 1985, Armand heard their Siberian husky named Paca pound on their door. He went a look and could not believe what he saw. At first, he thought it was a rag doll in the dog's mouth, but then realized it was a frozen little baby. The child was Caucasian, female, and still had her umbilical cord attached. Armin immediately called the police. Detectives were able to track the dog's path to about 700 feet from their home, where the baby was born in a gravel pit. It was determined the baby passed away from the cold she was left in and not from being carried home by Paca. Investigators couldn't find any sign of the woman who delivered the baby, just blood and placental material. They collected DNA from the scene and stored it so they could use it later. No one in the town knew who the person could be, so the case went cold. In 2020, Detective Jay Palladier was working at the Maine State Police Unsolved Homicide Unit and decided to take up the case. He was quoted as saying, Having been from the area, I remember the media coverage initially. With the addition of DNA and genealogy information, we felt that this was a case that could be worked on at this time. Detectives worked alongside Identifiers International to identify 58-year-old Leanne Deagle as the mother of baby Jane Doe. Police say that Leanne was 21 years old when she went to the gravel pit in Frenchville, Maine, to deliver the little baby girl. On June 13, 2022, Maine State Police traveled to Lowell, Massachusetts, to arrest Leanne Deagle, formerly known as Leanne Jarrett. She is currently being held without bail at the Aroostook County Jail in Holton, Maine, and has pleaded not guilty. Police interviewed Leanne's ex-husband, John Daigle, asking him if she had been pregnant when they met in the summer of 1985. John was a 23-year-old college student, and the two met at a July 4th celebration five months before she gave birth. John was shocked when he learned about the baby because he did not know she was pregnant back then. He said, I fell to the floor. It shocked me that she had delivered a baby all by herself at minus 30 degree weather, drove herself home. I'm sure she bled. John was also told that the DNA showed that he was not the father of the baby. 
The man who was the father lives in an assisted living facility in Florida and cannot communicate anymore. John told police that Leanne is a survivor of childhood violence at the hands of her alcoholic father. He also said he now wonders if Leanne feared that he would end the relationship and leave without her for the new life they had begun planning in New Hampshire if he knew about the pregnancy. In an interview with the Press Herald, he also said that he would have wanted to raise the baby had he known about it. She was protecting the relationship I had with her because she thought I would have dumped her lickety split. Leanne told her daughter, Chris, that she believed she may have been assaulted on the night of her 20th birthday, which was nine months before she gave birth. She has no memory of the night at all. Leanne said that she was unaware that she was pregnant in 1985. Leanne told Kristen that she was driving home from work, felt a strong urge to urinate, and then gave birth to a baby she believed was not alive anymore, on the side of a road near a gravel pit. Kristen said, My mom thought it was stillborn. It didn't cry. It didn't move. To her, the baby was not alive. So to her, it was some freak miscarriage and something that she wanted to leave in the past. People had miscarriages all the time. Police are asking anyone with information they believe may be relevant to the investigation to call Maine State Police at 2075 325 30-year-old Sherry Herrera lived in Tilera, California, in 1993. She was a mother of four. Sherry was a prostitute and a known drug user. She was reported missing by her family members on March 25, 1993. Five days later, on March 30th, Sherry's body was found on the Hayfield Road on-ramp to the I-10 in Desert Center. It is a rural area situated between Los Angeles and Phoenix. Sherry had been assaulted and strangled with a belt. There was also a bite mark on her body. Investigators collected all the DNA evidence they needed. The DNA samples were entered into the FBI's Combined DNA Index System in 2002. Then, in 2004, DNA from a different cold case was also submitted into the Combined DNA Index System. The case is that of Sheena Denise Hayes. She is from Titus County, Texas. Her body was found in April of 1992. She was assaulted and strangled with a device made of wire and cord in a manner to control the victim. Her body was discovered near an eye. 30 rest area in Mount Pleasant, about 100 miles east from Dallas, Texas. Sheena is also a prostitute like Sherry. When DNA of her attacker was entered into Cody's in 2004, investigators realized that the same man was responsible for taking Sheena and Sherry's lives. Even though they could come to this conclusion, DNA technology was not advanced enough to identify the unknown man. They could only determine that he was African-American and most likely lived in California or Texas. Recently, in September of 2020, Texas and California officials worked together and ultimately conducted genealogy research in the matching of DNA found at both crime scenes. In May of 2022, 67-year-old Douglas Thomas was identified as the person responsible for taking the life of Sheena Denise Hayes. He was arrested at his home in Waco, Texas. After his arrest, officials with the Riverside County Regional Cold Case team traveled to Texas to question Thomas about Sherry's case. After DNA testing, it was confirmed that Douglas Thomas was indeed responsible for taking the life of Sherry Herrera as well. Thomas is currently in McClendon County Jail, where he is being held on a $2 million bond. He will first face prosecution in Texas, then he will be taken to California to face the charges against him there. Thomas was a truck driver for over 40 years. He traveled extensively around the U.S. and only recently retired. Investigators are definitely looking into the possibility that he is involved in other unsolved cold cases. Authorities in California are asking anyone with information about the case to contact Riverside County Regional Cold Case Homicide Team at 1951955277. Sherry's son Adrian was only six years old when his mother's life was taken had this to say following the arrest. I don't know if I really believed it because it's like, man, this has been so long. I remember coming home from school and my stepmom told us the news of what had happened. Me and my sister were there. Obviously, we started bawling our eyes out. Melissa Rookiebo lived in Laquana County, Pennsylvania, in 2013 with her husband, Bruno Rukiba. On August 6, 2013, Bruno called 911. 
He told the operator he shot Melissa in the head inside their home, but claimed it was an accident. Melissa was taken to the hospital, but sadly succumbed to her injuries four days later. At first, Bruno was saying that they were fighting, but it was simply an accident. Then later, he said he was playing with the gun, and it went off. According to the police, Bruno changed his story seven times in just the first 24 hours. Investigators looked at surveillance footage depicting a heated argument between Bruno and Melissa. Authorities also learned about a family inheritance Melissa's mother wanted at a casino in Atlantic City for $1,500,000. This was seen as a potential motive. Despite investigators believing Bruno meant to fatally shoot Melissa, they did not have enough evidence to charge him. Recently, Pennsylvania State Police reinvestigated the case. Melissa's sister and daughters told the police that Bruno had pulled a gun on Melissa inside their home on previous occasions. Investigators also learned more about the $1,500,000 family inheritance. The remaining payouts of those funds were supposed to be split between Bruno and his two daughters. Police learned that Bruno has been stealing over $100,000 of those funds from his daughters since 2013. Investigators also used new technology to prove that Bruno meant to shoot Melissa. They didn't elaborate on what the new technology is. 56-year-old Bruno Rukuba was arrested on June 3, 2022. He was charged with taking the life of Melissa and theft. Trooper Robert Urban had this to say, When it comes to investigations that are open, we always investigate them and try to uncover new leads. Well, in this case, we interviewed more people. We used different technology, different audio devices to make other interviews clearer. In the past, we've, you know, through more investigatory leads, we've seen the stories have been changed, and the counts of what Bruno said then we found to be, you know, dishonest and proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It's great when you could have closure with a case like this. You have a lot of family members, and everything else will make sense about what deep down they may have thought would have happened, but they were sure. Now we're actually able to investigate this the whole way and prove Mr. Rakuba as being guilty. And I think this adds closure to the family members and friends in the community. On December 8, 1993, a homeowner in Shotcock County, Oklahoma, discovered human remains in her backyard, so she called 911. Deputies with the Chalkaw County Sheriff's Office responded to the home. They contacted the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation and requested assistance in the investigation. An autopsy performed by doctors in the Oklahoma Chief Medical Examiner's Office determined that the remains belonged to a male baby. It was also determined that the baby had been born alive. The medical examiner ruled that the baby boy's throat had been slashed. Investigators conducted numerous interviews after the discovery of the baby's body, but the case went cold. Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation agents obtained and stored DNA evidence from the scene for possible future use. In 2020, law enforcement took another look at the case, trying to finally identify the boy. They submitted the DNA evidence they had collected to Parabon Nanolabs. As many of you will know by now, Parabon specializes in providing phenotyping services to law enforcement agencies. The results from Parabon Nanolabs came back in April of 2021. After reviewing the results, the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation team began pursuing new leads. That led them to 53-year-old Mountia Michelle Allen. On Wednesday, June 15, 2022, an Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation agent met with Allen at the Durant Police Department in Oklahoma. During the interview, Allen agreed to submit samples of her DNA to be tested to determine if she was the biological mother of the baby doe. Shortly after providing the DNA sample, Allen admitted that she was, in fact, the biological mother. During a follow-up interview a few days later, Allen confessed to cutting the baby's throat shortly after his birth. At the time, Allen worked at a daycare center. According to investigators, she said that she did not tell anyone about her pregnancy or delivery. She also told no one what she did to the baby. Allen was booked into the Choctaw County Detention Center and is being held without bond. It has not been made public yet why she did what she did or who the father is. Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation Director Ricky Adams said in a statement, The synergy between our agents and criminalists to solve cold cases, especially those with an unidentified victim, is to be applauded. Identifying the use of genetic genealogy as a tool 
and the work of Parabon and our internal genealogy specialist provided significant leads in this disturbing case. Baby Doe can now be properly laid to rest, and Alan will be held accountable. 22-year-old Rashid Young lived in Pottstown, Pennsylvania in 2019. Pottstown is about 40 miles northwest of Philadelphia. He shared the home he lived in with his boyfriend, Kayshawn Sheffield. Kayshawn was 17 years old at the time. Rashid vanished on August 19, 2019. Shortly after, his family and friends received text messages from his phone cutting ties with him. Just over a month later, unidentified and decomposing remains belonging to a male were discovered by a landscaper at the Aubrey Arbor Ray Dam in the Philadelphia neighborhood of Germantown. At the time, a post-mortem examination was unable to identify the victim. Kishan reported Rashid missing in December 2019, two months after he had been last seen. The link between the body found and Rashid's disappearance was unfortunately not made initially. For more than two years, the body remained unidentified. Montgomery County investigators recently increased their efforts in finding Rashid. His family also hired a private investigator to look into his disappearance. The investigation found, through the use of a confidential informant, cell phone records, and other investigative means, that Rashid had been dating Kishan for two years at the time he disappeared. Investigators had not known about Kishan before this. Investigators then went to interview Kishan Sheffield. He just told them he was no longer in contact with Rashid after a fight they had. Investigators believed he wasn't telling them everything he knew, so they continued investigating. Witnesses finally came forward, saying that he helped Sheffield dig a hole at the Aubrey Arbor Ray Dam for Rashid's body. Investigators had to make sure there's truth to his story. They were able to confirm that the unknown man who was buried in the Arboretum was, in fact, Rashid. Now they had to see if Sheffield really was responsible. They found that Sheffield made numerous withdrawals from Rashid's $2 million trust fund. He was also driving Rashid's car. Investigators also found that the messages to Rashid's family and friends cutting ties actually came from Sheffield. Even more damning, investigators discovered that Sheffield flooded Rashid's house to get rid of possible evidence. On June 1, 2022, Kayshawn Sheffield was arrested at his home in Philadelphia in connection to the case. Sheffield is in custody at the Montgomery County Detention Facility. He's being held without bail. Investigators gave a summary of what took place in their press conference. According to them, Sheffield fatally stabbed Rashid at his home on August 19, 2019. He then later intentionally flooded the home to destroy evidence. Sheffield stuffed Rashid's remains into a recycling container. He transported the container to his mother's house. Sheffield then contacted the witness, and the two of them buried Rashid at the Arboretum. He then accessed Rashid's social media accounts to give the appearance that Rashid was still alive from August to December of 2019. Investigators have not released a motive but described the crime as domestic violence related. Sheffield has been charged with taking Rashid's life theft by unlawful taking, receiving stolen property, possessing an instrument of crime, and access device fraud. 37-year-old Lena Reyes Giddies lived in Yorkstown, Ohio, with her husband, Edward Giddies. On April 8, 1998, Lena left her home on a trip from Ohio to Dallas, and then New Mexico to visit her family. That would be the last time anyone would see Lena alive. Six months later, with no sign of Lena since she left their home, Edward reported his wife missing. Investigators found it a bit strange that it took six months for Edward to report her missing. He was named a suspect, but investigators couldn't find enough concrete evidence against him. Edward was interviewed by police in October of 1998. During the interview, he claimed his wife had planned to fly from Pittsburgh, and he dropped her off at the airport. On April 20th, 1998, an unidentified deceased female was located along State Route 276 near Maiden Water Spring in Utah's Garfield County. When investigators arrived, they found a woman in her late 30s to mid-40s, covered with plastic bags, wrapped in duct tape, tied with rope, and placed inside a sleeping bag before being wrapped in a carpet. The woman had been shot, and her hands were cut off, making identification difficult. Sketches of the woman were shared, hoping someone would recognize her. 
Despite an exhaustive investigation by the Garfield County Sheriff's Office and the Utah State Bureau of Investigation, the woman was not identified, and the case went cold. Since the woman could not be identified, she became known as the Maiden Water Jane Doe. In 2018, Ohio updated Lena's missing persons file and obtained a picture of her from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Immigration and Customs Enforcement. A private citizen in California who enjoys researching true crime cases then linked the Maiden Water Jane Doe case to Lena. The internet sleuth noticed the mole in the right ear and told Utah authorities to call Youngtown's police about the missing case involving Lena. Lena's sister traveled from Mexico to offer DNA swabs, and investigators confirmed that the Maiden Water Jane Doe is indeed Lena Reyes Geddes. The question now is who took Lena's life? They interviewed many people who knew her. They wanted to talk to her husband, Edward Geddes, but he had taken his own life back in 2001. Another man police looked into was Scott Kimball, who took the lives of at least four people and is suspected in many other cases. Kimball was ultimately ruled out as a suspect. Investigators decided to try and find DNA on the plastic bags, rope, sleeping bag, and other items found at the crime scene. They found DNA belonging to a male on the rope. They wanted to compare Edward's DNA to see if it matched, but he had been cremated, so they couldn't exhume him. After tracking down family members, their DNA samples were obtained. Finally, in 2022, it was confirmed that Edward Giddy's DNA matched the DNA of the unknown man found on the rope. Investigators announced at a press conference in June 2022 that they have enough evidence to say he was the one who took her life and to close the case. While it is frustrating that Edward is not alive anymore to face charges against him, at least we know he was miserable because he took his own life. Investigators found no sign that Lena traveled anywhere and believe her trip was a ruse by Edward. They don't know why Edward drove across the country to dispose of his wife's remains or why he decided to take her life. Utah State Bureau of Investigation agent Brian Davis said at the press conference, There's a lot of ups and downs in law enforcement but I would put this case at the top of just making you feel good. At least there's some closure, at least there's answers. Davis also mentioned it's not just the DNA that they have evidence against Edward, but also other circumstantial evidence. Lena's sister Lucero, who had given her DNA to help identify Lena, said, I felt like for 20 years, no one would listen to me, but now I know what happened. I'm here to bring her home. Not like I expected, but I'm bringing her back home with me. 54-year-old Nora Sheehan lived in Cork, Ireland. She was a mother of three. Nora was last seen when she attended a medical appointment for a dog bite at the South Infirmary Hospital on June 6, 1981. When Nora did not return home after the appointment, her family reported her missing. The National Police Service of the Republic of Ireland, or the Gardaí as they are more commonly referred to, started searching for Nora. Six days later, Nora's body was found by forestry workers at the viewing point in the Chapel Woods, about 18 miles from where she was last seen. It was not revealed how her life was taken, but the investigators simply noted that it was violent. Despite the Gardai investigating the case, they could not identify the person who took her life. In 2016, the Gardai Serious Crime Review Team reopened the cold case and spent several years examining all details associated with it. In June of 2022, detectives arrested 73-year-old Noel Long at his home in Malbancourt in connection to Nora's case. He was then taken to Bandon Garda Station, where a short hearing was held, and it seems that Long will enter a guilty plea. His attorney, Eddie Burke, said that his client was a 73-year-old man in receipt of a state pension. Burke also requested that Long receive all necessary medical treatment while on remand because he has severe medical issues. Detectives have not made it public what exactly led them to Noel Long because it is still an ongoing investigation. Sabir Chatterjee lived in Houston, Texas in 2002. Originally from Sri Lanka, Sabir owned and operated the Coastal Gas Station convenience store. On February 15, 2002, around 12.50 p.m., Officers with the Oak Ridge North Police Department were dispatched to Sabir's store because witnesses heard gunshots. Officers who arrived at the scene found Sabir's body in the office area of the gas station. He had been shot in the head. It was also discovered that someone had taken $160,000 in cash from the store. 
Investigators collected forensic evidence at the crime scene, including DNA that belonged to the person who took Sabir's life. The DNA was found under Sabir's fingernails, and there was also blood from the suspect found, which was stored for later use. At the time, law enforcement had few leads. The witness descriptions were vague, and with no surveillance footage, there were no suspects. The case went cold for almost 20 years. Detective Kent Hubbard, who was the first one to arrive at the scene, persisted in investigating the case. He worked various leads over time before coming across an article outlining how law enforcement in California used genealogy and DNA to solve cold cases. Hubbard then reached out to Parabon Nanolabs, an organization that uses genetic genealogy, phenotyping, ancestry, and kinship analysis to assist law enforcement in developing potential suspects for cases where DNA evidence is present. With the agreement of the Oak Ridge Police Department and the assistance of the Montgomery County District Attorney's Office, Hubbard requested and received funds to pay for the testing. In 2018, Parabon told Hubbard they identified three possible men whose DNA might be a match for the DNA sample found at the crime scene back in 2002. In 2019, investigators followed one of the men to a restaurant and collected his DNA sample from a fork, coffee cup, and a piece of toast. After more DNA testing, on December 4, 2019, it was announced that the DNA from the crime scene matched Martin Isaac Tell's DNA. On December 10, 2019, Tells was arrested for the crime. Following the arrest, Tells confessed to taking Sabir's life while robbing him. He explained that his blood was present at the scene because Sabir struck him on the head with a telephone to defend himself. While the case was pending, Tells was out on a $500,000 bail. He cut off his GPS monitoring device and fled to Mexico. Fortunately, agents from Homeland Security and the U.S. Marshals successfully tracked him down and brought him back to the U.S. His trial started in 2022, and on June 28, he pleaded guilty. Tells was sentenced to 60 years in prison. Assistant District Attorney Donna Hansen said, Martin Tells lived more than 20 years of his life with his family and his loved ones around him. Meanwhile, members of the Chatterjee family were left with an empty chair and aching hearts believing they might never know who was responsible. Detective Kent Hubbard never gave up on this case, and it was my privilege to be able to assist in bringing justice and closure to Sabir's family. Every life taken creates a wound in our community and in the lives of the victim's family. Some of those wounds, like the loss of this beloved father and husband, are very deep. In this case, those wounds were laid bare for decades. District Attorney Brett Legon said, Fortunately, a relentless instrument of dog justice in the form of Detective Hubbard made what was wrong, right? And we hope that this measure of accountability will bring some relief to his grieving family. 17-year-old Michelle Kosk lived in Seattle, Washington, in 1990. She was last seen leaving one of her friend's apartments on August 18th. A week later, a woman walking her dog near Echo Lake Road on Highway 522 in Snohomish came upon Michelle's body. The area is about 15 miles from where she was last seen. Michelle had been assaulted and suffered blunt force trauma to the head. The weapon used was determined to be pieces of concrete found nearby. Investigators collected DNA from the crime scene that belonged to the person who took her life. They also questioned criminals who had committed similar crimes in the area but received no useful information. No witnesses came forward either, and the case soon went cold. Detectives Jim Sharp and David Heitzman reopened the case in 2005. A DNA profile of the suspect was then created, and they entered it into the federal database, but unfortunately, this did not yield any results. The detectives could, however, rule out suspects. Recently, they turned to Parabon Nanolabs for assistance in identifying the suspect and obtaining justice. Geneticists at Parabon had to first deconvolute the DNA sample because it contained the DNA from both the suspect and the victim. Dr. Janet Cady, who was the senior director of bioinformatics scientists at Parabon, said the crime scene of Michelle's case was particularly challenging. Without mixture deconvolution, the genetic genealogy matches would have included relatives of the victim and led investigators down the wrong path. Experts spent about one year building family trees and entering their findings into public genealogy websites such as Family Tree DNA and GED Match. Ultimately, this process led them to two brothers of the suspect. 
In 2022, after more testing, investigators announced that Robert Brooks is the man responsible for taking the life of Michelle Kosk. Brooks was 22 years old at the time of the crime, having just been released from prison when he took Michelle's life. Brooks was living with a relative only a few blocks from where she lived. It's not known if the two knew each other. Brooks passed away due to natural causes at the age of 48 in King County, Washington, on October 26, 2016. The estimated probability of selecting an unrelated individual at random from the U.S. population with a matching profile is 1 in 1.2 quadrillion, said the sheriff's office. Both the sheriff's office and Parabon Nanolabs praised Detective Sharp for his work. He was also involved in solving the cases of Jay Cook and Tanya Van Kielienberg that I have covered before on the channel. Some of those who knew Michelle spoke at the news conference to share the relief that the case has finally been solved, including her friend Melissa Johnson, who had known her since she was 10 years old. I often wonder what she would have been like had she still been alive, and how different my life would be as well," said Johnson. I now pray that Michelle can finally rest in peace. 23-year-old Diane Cusick lived in Nassau County, New York, in 1968. She worked as a dance teacher and lived with her parents after becoming estranged from her husband, with whom she had a daughter named Darlene. Diane called her parents on the night of February 15, 1968, to tell them that she was going to the mall to purchase shoes. However, she never returned home. After a few hours, her parents grew worried, and her father drove to the mall to find Diane. Unfortunately, he discovered her brutally beaten and assaulted body in the backseat of the family's 1961 Plymouth Valiant in the parking lot of Valley Stream's Green Acres Mall. Diane had been suffocated and had defensive wounds on her hands. Investigators released a description of a suspect, a white male in his late teens or early 20s, with an average build, eyeglasses, and standing at least 5 feet 8 inches tall. The man had been spotted at the movie theater in the mall shortly before Diane's body was discovered, and police suspected he might have been loitering in the area. Despite a search effort involving over a hundred Nassau police officers and showing her photo to more than 2,000 people, the case went cold. In June 2022, investigators entered the suspect's DNA profile into public DNA databases and found a match. The DNA belonged to Richard Cottingham, a notorious criminal responsible for taking the lives of many women. Cottingham is already serving a life sentence in a New Jersey prison and has pleaded not guilty. Due to his health condition, he had to be arraigned in a hospital bed. Nassau County District Attorney and Donnelly emphasized that this may be the oldest case ever prosecuted based on DNA evidence and warned against being deceived by Cottingham's frail appearance. Diane's daughter, Darlene Altman, expressed her surprise and gratitude for finally achieving justice for her mother. She wore a necklace with a ballerina slipper charm that belonged to her mother and attended the arraignment. Detectives are now investigating other unsolved cases from 1967 to 1980, the period when Cottingham was active, including those in Nassau County. 57-year-old David Evans lived in Claremont, California, in 1985. He was the vice president at a bank and a former school superintendent, residing alone after his divorce. On October 13, 1985, David's body was found inside his home, revealing severe beatings and blunt force trauma to the head. The discovery was made by a Claremont police officer responding to a possible burglary call. David Evans, a Duke-educated school administrator who transitioned into the banking industry midlife, was a well-regarded figure in the community. Despite generating a few leads at the time of the crime, investigators were unable to identify viable suspects, and the case eventually went cold. In 2006, authorities revisited the case following advances in forensic technology. They discovered a small amount of DNA and fingerprints at the crime scene, eventually identifying the suspect as Hillary Marcus Duplissis. Further investigation revealed that Duplissis lived in the St. Gabriel Valley area at the time of the crime, not far from David's residence. Additionally, he was linked to the theft and abandonment of David's vehicle in Covina, California, about two hours after the crime. On May 2, 2022, Duplissis was charged with ending the life of David Evans. Currently incarcerated in a New York State prison for a similar crime, he will be eligible for parole in that case in 2033. 
Duplices will be transported to Los Angeles for arraignment on the new charges. Lieutenant Yuga Renaga stated that they believe they know why Duplices committed the crime, but refrained from revealing too much information before the case goes to trial. Renaga expressed gratitude to the investigative team, including members from the Sheriff's Office, Claremont Police Department, New York State Police, and the New York Department of Corrections, for bringing long-awaited justice and closure to David Evans' family. On December 8, 1993, a homeowner in Choctaw County, Oklahoma, discovered human remains in her backyard, prompting her to call 911. Deputies from the Choctaw County Sheriff's Office responded, subsequently reaching out to the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation for assistance. An autopsy conducted by doctors at the Oklahoma Chief Medical Examiner's Office determined that the remains belonged to a male baby and that the baby had been born alive. The medical examiner ruled that the baby boy's throat had been slashed, initiating investigations that went cold despite numerous interviews. In 2020, law enforcement revisited the case, aiming to identify the boy. They submitted DNA evidence collected from the scene to Parabon Nano Labs, known for providing phenotyping services to law enforcement agencies. The results, received in April 2021, led the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation team to pursue new leads, eventually leading them to 53-year-old Mountia Michelle Allen. On Wednesday, June 15, 2022, an Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation agent interviewed Allen at the Durant Police Department. During the interview, Allen agreed to submit DNA samples to determine if she was the biological mother of the baby doe. Shortly after providing the DNA sample, Allen admitted to being the biological mother and confessed to cutting the baby's throat shortly after birth. At the time of the incident, Allen worked at a daycare center. Investigators noted that she did not disclose her pregnancy or delivery to anyone, keeping the details of her actions hidden. Allen was booked into the Choctaw County Detention Center and is being held without bond. The motive behind her actions and information about the father have not been made public. Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation Director Ricky Adams applauded the synergy between agents and criminalists in solving cold cases, especially those with unidentified victims. The use of genetic genealogy, facilitated by Parabon and internal genealogy specialists, provided significant leads in this disturbing case. The director expressed relief that Baby Doe can now be properly laid to rest, and Allen will be held accountable. 22-year-old Rashid Young lived in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, in 2019, a town about 40 miles northwest of Philadelphia. He shared a home with his boyfriend, Kishan Sheffield, who was 17 at the time. Rashid went missing on August 19, 2019, and shortly after, his family and friends received text messages from his phone, severing ties with him. A little over a month later, decomposing remains of an unidentified male were discovered by a landscaper at Aubrey Arboratham in the Germantown neighborhood of Philadelphia. Initially, the post-mortem examination could not identify the victim. Rashid was reported missing by Kishan in December 2019, two months after he was last seen. The connection between the discovered body and Rashid's disappearance wasn't immediately established, and for over two years, the body remained unidentified. Montgomery County investigators intensified efforts to find Rashid, and his family hired a private investigator, who, through various investigative means, found that Rashid had been dating Kishan for two years before he disappeared. Investigators, unaware of Kishan's involvement until then, interviewed him. Kishan initially claimed he lost contact with Rashid after a fight, but investigators suspected he was withholding information. A witness eventually came forward, stating that he helped Sheffield bury Rashid at the Aubrey Arbor Ray Dam. Investigators verified the story, confirming that the unknown man buried in the Arboretum was indeed Rashid. They discovered that Kishan Sheffield made numerous withdrawals from Rashid's $2 million trust fund and was driving Rashid's car. Additionally, the messages to Rashid's family and friends, cutting ties, were traced back to Sheffield. Investigators uncovered further evidence, revealing that Sheffield flooded Rashid's house to eliminate potential evidence. On June 1, 2022, Kishan Sheffield was arrested at his home in Philadelphia in connection to the case. He is in custody at the Montgomery County Detention Facility, held without bail. 
Investigators detailed the sequence of events in a press conference, stating that Sheffield fatally stabbed Rashid at his home in August 2019, intentionally flooding the house to destroy evidence. Sheffield disposed of Rashid's remains in a recycling container, transporting it to his mother's house. He then collaborated with a witness to bury Rashid at the Arboretum and accessed Rashid's social media accounts to create the illusion that he was still alive from August to December 2019. Although investigators have not released a motive, they described the crime as domestic violence related. Sheffield faces charges, including taking Rashid's life, theft by unlawful taking, receiving stolen property, possessing an instrument of crime, and access device fraud. 25-year-old Lori Houts lived in Mountain View, California, in 1992, working as a computer engineer. On September 5th of the same year, Lori's body was discovered in her car near a garbage dump about a mile away from her workplace. She had been strangled with a rope that was still around her neck, and police found footprints on the inside of her windshield. A prime suspect, John Kevin Woodward, emerged quickly. Woodward was allegedly openly jealous of Lori, having developed a romantic attachment to Lori's boyfriend, who was also his roommate. Woodward faced two trials in the late 1990s, but both were unsuccessful. The judge dismissed the case for insufficient evidence after the jury could not reach a verdict in the second trial. While Woodward's fingerprints were found on the outside of Lori's car, investigators couldn't establish his presence inside the car. Woodward later moved to the Netherlands and became the president and CEO of ReadyTech, an online training company in the Bay Area. Despite the trial setbacks, investigators persisted in Lori's case, following up on leads and searching for evidence. In late 2020, forensic evidence from the case was resubmitted for further analysis. Over 80 latent fingerprints collected at the crime scene were re-examined by the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office Identification Unit. This resulted in more fingerprints matching Woodward, found in places only the perpetrator could have touched. John Woodward was apprehended by police at JFK Airport in New York on July 9, 2022, after arriving from Amsterdam. If convicted, he faces life in prison. Deputy District Attorney Rob Baker of Santa Clara County's DA office expressed his satisfaction with having a second chance for justice after nearly 30 years. He acknowledged the rarity of discovering new evidence decades after a case is dismissed and credited advances in forensic science for reopening the case. Lori's family issued a statement, expressing hope for justice and gratitude to law enforcement agencies that never gave up on her memory. In Lori's honor, the family established the Lori House Memorial Girls Athletic Scholarship, supporting graduating female seniors with donations. 12-year-old Laisha Michelle Jackson lived in Montgomery County, Texas, in 1979. On September 7th of that year, she left her home to spend the day at a community pool in her neighborhood. When she didn't return home, her family became worried and called 911. The following day, Laisha's glasses were found at a local intersection, but there was no other sign of her. Six days later, on September 13, 1979, an oil field worker discovered her body in a heavily wooded area near a pipeline in Montgomery County. An autopsy report revealed that she had been assaulted before her life was taken, and investigators collected DNA from her body, preserving it for future use. Detectives conducted an extensive investigation into the case that lasted for years, exploring all leads. However, the case eventually went cold. In 2021, investigators decided to revisit the case and employed a new technology called MVAC, which enhances DNA collection. MVAC allows investigators to collect DNA from porous and rough surfaces, expanding the potential for evidentiary items. The Montgomery County Sheriff's Office cold case squad used this technology in October 2021 to successfully extract unknown DNA from Laisha's clothing collected at the crime scene. The unknown DNA was sent to Texas DPS Forensic Science, which developed the DNA profile of the perpetrator. In 2022, investigators submitted the profile to the FBI's combined DNA index system, CODES, and found a match with a man named Gerald Dwight Casey. Casey had been executed in 2002 for taking another person's life in Montgomery County in 1989. In 1989, Casey, then 34 years old, and an accomplice, 36-year-old Carla Smith, 
attempted to steal guns from a man named Daryl Pennington. Instead, they encountered Pennington's roommate, Sonia Lynn Howell. Casey beat her with the home telephone and shot her nine times before dumping her body in a wooded area. He was convicted in 1991. Prior to Howell's murder, Casey had a history of convictions, including burglary and multiple drug charges. The Montgomery County Sheriff's Office noted that this marks the oldest cold case solved by their department to date. Eighty-year-old Antonio Rodriguez and his 77-year-old wife Luz lived in Cleveland in 2005. Antonio was a World War II veteran. The couple had been a beloved fixture in Cleveland and were known for their kindness. They operated a small Mexican food restaurant from their home to serve shift workers at a local plywood mill. On April 14, 2005, the couple's daughter, Carolina Tata, went to their home to make lunch for them. They didn't answer the door so she thought they might be asleep, but still entered to make them lunch. Carolina then found her father's body on the floor of their bedroom and her mother's body in their bed. They had both been beaten and strangled. Police dogs were able to track the scent of a suspect across some railroad tracks to a nearby apartment complex, but were unable to lead investigators any further than that. Blood from an unknown suspect was found on a large rug in the couple's home, and the DNA was entered into the FBI's combined DNA index system. But there were no hits at the time. For years, the case went cold. Then in March of 2021, when investigators again entered the DNA sample in Dakotas, they found a match. The DNA was linked to Shelley Susan Thompson Lemoyne. She was serving time in a Texas prison for an unrelated drug offense. Lemoyne denied knowing the Rodriguez family and having any involvement in the crime. Another DNA sample was taken from her at the prison, and it was matched to the DNA found at the crime scene back in 2005. She was arrested on the 8th of July of 2022 outside her parole office in connection to the Rodriguez case. Cleveland Police Chief Daryl Braz said had this to say after the arrest was made. Sometimes such small pieces of evidence can solve a case, and in this case, it was that piece of carpet that was found inside the home that had a speck of blood on it. For the couple's family, it was a welcome development in the case that has continued to haunt the family. Their daughter, Carolina Tata, who made the horrific discovery, said, I knew it would come. I didn't know this long, but I knew this day would come. The community has always kept our parents in their prayers, and we're just very thankful, and God is good. She also said that she believes more people could have been involved in the slaying, and that she did not know and had never seen Thompson Lemoyne. Martin Rodriguez, another one of the couple's 10 children, said that he believes the arrest is the first step in helping the family heal from the tragedy. I've seen the hand of God at work today. Our family is extremely relieved that there is activity in our parents' case. We are grateful for the efforts of the Texas Rangers, particularly Ranger Best, Cleveland Police Department, and the Liberty County District Attorney's Office. They have shown that they do care about what happened to our parents. They have restored our hope and faith in the justice system. 37-year-old Lena Reyes Giddies lived in Yorktown, Ohio, with her husband, Edward Giddies. On April 8, 1998, Lena left her home on a trip from Ohio to Dallas and then New Mexico to visit her family. That would be the last time anyone would see Lena alive. Six months later, with no sign of Lena since she left their home, Edward reported his wife missing. Investigators found it a bit strange that it took six months for Edward to report her missing. He was named a suspect, but investigators couldn't find enough concrete evidence against him. Edward was interviewed by police in October of 1998. During the interview, he claimed his wife had planned to fly from Pittsburgh, and he dropped her off at the airport. On April 20, 1998, an unidentified deceased female was located along State Route 276, near Maiden Water Spring in Utah's Garfield County. When investigators arrived, they found a woman in her late 30s to mid-40s covered with plastic bags, wrapped in duct tape, tied with rope, and placed inside a sleeping bag before being wrapped in a carpet. The woman had been shot, and her hands were cut off, making identification difficult. Sketches of the woman were shared around in the hope that someone would recognize her. Despite an exhaustive investigation by the Garfield County Sheriff's Office and the Utah State Bureau of Investigation, the woman was not identified, and the case went cold. 
Since the woman could not be identified, she became known as the Maiden Water Jane Doe. In 2018, Ohio updated Lena's missing persons file and obtained a picture of her from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security Immigration and Customs Enforcement. A private citizen in California who enjoys researching true crime cases then linked the Maiden Water Jane Doe case to Lena. The internet sleuth noticed the mole in the right ear and told Utah authorities to call Youngstown's police about the missing case involving Lena. Lena's sister traveled from Mexico to offer DNA swaps. Not long after, investigators were able to confirm that the Maiden Water Jane Doe is indeed Lena Reyes Giddies. The question now is who took Lena's life? They interviewed a lot of people who knew her. They wanted to talk to her husband, Edward Giddy, but he had taken his own life back in 2001. Another man police looked into is Scott Kimball. He took the lives of at least four people and is suspected in many other cases. Kimball was ultimately ruled out as a suspect. Investigators decided to try and find DNA on the plastic bags, rope, sleeping bag, and other items found at the crime scene. They were able to find DNA belonging to a male on the rope. They wanted to compare Edward's DNA to see if it belonged to him, but he had been cremated, so they couldn't exhume him. After family members of his were tracked down, their DNA samples were obtained. Finally, in 2022, it was confirmed that Edward Giddy's DNA matched the DNA of the unknown man found on the rope. Investigators announced at a press conference in June of 2022 that they have enough evidence to say he was the one who took her life and to close the case. While it is frustrating that Edward is not alive anymore to face the charges against him, we at least know he was miserable because he took his own life. Investigators have found no sign that Lena traveled anywhere and believe her trip was a ruse by Edward. They don't know why Edward drove across the country to dispose of his wife's remains or why he decided to take her life. Utah State Bureau of Investigation agent Brian Davis said at the press conference, There's a lot of ups and downs in law enforcement, but I would put this case at the top of just making you feel good. At least there's some closure. At least there's answers. Davis also mentioned it's not just the DNA that they have as evidence against Edward, but also other circumstantial evidence. Lena's sister Lucero, who had given her DNA to help identify Lena, said, I felt like for 20 years, no one would listen to me, but now I know what happened. I'm here to bring her home, not like I expected, but I'm bringing her back home with me. 54-year-old Nora Sheehan lived in Cork, Ireland. She was a mother of three. Nora was last seen when she attended a medical appointment for a dog bite at the South Infirmary Hospital on June 6, 1981. When Nora did not return home after her appointment, her family reported her missing. The National Police Service of the Republic of Ireland, or the Gardaí as they are more commonly referred to, started searching for Nora. Six days later, Nora's body was found by forestry workers at the viewing point in the Chipplewoods. It's about 18 miles from where she was last seen. It was not revealed how her life was taken, but the investigators simply noted that it was violent. Despite the Gardai investigating the case, they could not identify the person who took her life. In 2016, the Gardai Serious Crime Review Team reopened the cold case and spent several years examining all details associated with it. In June of 2022, detectives arrested 73-year-old Noel Long at his home in Mabong Court in connection to Nora's case. He was then taken to Bond in Garda Station, and a short hearing was held where it seems that Long will take a guilty plea. His attorney, Eddie Burke, said that his client was a 73-year-old man in receipt of a state pension. Burke also told us that Long will receive all necessary medical treatment while on remand because he has severe medical issues. Detectives have not made it public what exactly led them to Noel Long because it is still an ongoing investigation. Sabir Chatterjee lived in Houston, Texas, in 2002. He was originally from Sri Lanka. Sabir owned and operated the Coastal Gas Station convenience store. On February 15, 2002, around 12.50 p.m., Officers with the Oak Ridge North Police Department were dispatched to Sabir's store because witnesses heard gunshots. Officers who arrived at the scene found Sabir's body in the office area of the gas station. He had been shot in the head. It was also discovered that someone had taken $160,000 in cash from the store. Investigators collected forensic evidence at the crime scene, including DNA that belonged to the person who took Sabir's life. 
The DNA was found under Sabir's fingernails, and there was also blood from the suspect found. It was stored so it could be used later. At the time, law enforcement had few leads, and the witnesses' descriptions were vague. With no surveillance footage, there were no suspects. The case went cold for almost 20 years. Detective Kent Hubbard, who was the first one to arrive at the scene, persisted in investigating the case. He worked various leads all the time before coming across an outline of how law enforcement in California used genealogy and DNA to solve cold cases. Hubbard then reached out to Parabon Nano Labs, an organization that uses genetic genealogy, phenotyping, ancestry, and kinship analysis to assist law enforcement in developing potential suspects for cases where DNA evidence is present. With the agreement of the Oak Ridge Police Department and the assistance of the Montgomery County District's Attorney's Office, Hubbard requested and received funds to pay for the testing. In 2018, Parabon told Hubbard they identified three possible men whose DNA might match the DNA sample found at the crime scene back in 2002. In 2019, investigators followed one of the men to a restaurant. There, they collected his DNA sample from a fork, coffee cup, and a piece of toast. After more DNA testing, on December 4, 2019, it was announced that the DNA from the crime scene matched Martin Isaac Tella's DNA. On December 10, 2019, Tella was arrested for the crime. Following the arrest, Tella confessed to taking Sabir's life while robbing him. He explained that his blood was present at the scene because Sabir struck him in the head with a telephone to defend himself. While the case was pending, Tello was out on a $500,000 bail. He cut off his GPS monitoring device and fled to Mexico. Fortunately, agents from Homeland Security and the U.S. Marshals successfully tracked him down and brought him back to the U.S. His trial started in 2022. On June 28, he pleaded guilty. Tello was sentenced to 60 years in prison. Assistant District Attorney Donna Hansen said, Martin Tella lived more than 20 years of his life with his family and his loved ones around him. Meanwhile, members of the Chatterjee family were left with an empty chair and aching hearts, believing they might never know who was responsible. Detective Kent Hubbard never gave up on this case, and it was my privilege to be able to assist in bringing justice and closure to Sabir's family. Every life taken creates a wound in our community and in the lives of the victim's family. Some of those wounds, like the loss of this beloved father and husband, are very deep. In this case, those wounds were laid bare for decades. District Attorney Brett Legion said, Fortunately, a relentless instrument of dog justice in the form of Detective Hubbard made what was wrong right. And we hope that this measure of accountability will bring some relief to his grieving family. 17-year-old Michelle Kosky lived in Seattle, Washington in 1990. She was last seen leaving one of her friend's apartments on August 18th. A week later, a woman walking her dog near Echo Lake Road on Highway 522 in Snohomish came upon Michelle's body. The area is about 15 miles from where she was last seen. Michelle had been assaulted and suffered blunt force trauma to the head. The weapon used was determined to be pieces of concrete found nearby. Investigators collected DNA from the crime scene that belonged to the person who took her life. They also questioned criminals who had committed similar crimes in the area but received no useful information. No witnesses came forward either, and the case soon went cold. Detectives Jim Sharp and David Heitzman reopened the case in 2005. A DNA profile of the suspect was then created, and they entered it into the federal database, but unfortunately, this did not yield any results. The detectives could, however, rule out suspects. Recently, they turned to Parabon Nanolabs for assistance in identifying the suspect and obtaining justice. The genealogists at Parabon had to first deconvolute the DNA sample because it contained the DNA from both the suspect and the victim. Dr. Janet Cady, the senior director bioinformatics scientist at Parabon, said, The crime scene in Michelle's case was particularly challenging. Without mixture deconvolution, the genetic genealogy matches would have included relatives of the victim and led investigators down the wrong path. Experts spent about one year building family trees and entering their findings into public genealogy websites such as Family Tree DNA and GED Manage. Ultimately, this process led them to two brothers of the suspect. In 2022, after more testing, investigators announced that Robert Brooks is the man responsible for taking the life of Michelle Kosky. 
Brooks was 22 years old at the time of the crime. He had just been released from prison when he took Michelle's life. Brooks was living with a relative only a few blocks from where she lived. It's not known if the two knew each other. Brooks passed away due to natural causes at the age of 48 in King County, Washington, on October 26, 2016. The estimated probability of selecting an unrelated individual at random from the U.S. population with a matching profile is 1 in 1.2 quadrillion, said the sheriff's office. Both the sheriff's office and Parabon Nanolabs praised Detective Sharp for his work. He was also involved in solving the cases of Jake Cook and Tanya Vankulenberg that I have covered before on the channel. Some of those who knew Michelle spoke at the news conference to share the relief that the case has finally been solved, including her friend Melissa Johnson, who had known her since she was 10 years old. I often wonder what she would have been like had she still been alive, and how different my life would be as well," said Johnson. I now pray that Michelle can finally rest in peace. 23-year-old Diane Cusick lived in Nassau County, New York, in 1968. She worked as a dance teacher and lived with her parents after becoming estranged from her husband, with whom she had a daughter named Arlene. On the night of February 19, 1968, Diane called her parents to inform them that she was going to the mall to purchase shoes but never returned home. After a few hours, her worried father drove to the mall and discovered her body in the back seat of the family's 1961 Plymouth Valiant, in the parking lot of Valley Stream's Green Acres Mall. Diane had been brutally beaten and assaulted in that car, suffocated, and had defensive wounds on her hands. Investigators released a description of a suspect, a white male in his late teens or early 20s with an average build, eyeglasses, and standing at least 5 feet 8 inches tall. The man had been spotted at the movie theater in the mall shortly before Diane's body was found, and police believed he might have been loitering in the area. At least a hundred Nassau police officers searched the area and showed Diane's photo to more than 2,000 people to gather information on her last hours. DNA belonging to the suspect was collected from the crime scene, and Diane's estranged husband, initially questioned, was ruled out as a suspect. Despite years passing and the trail growing cold, a breakthrough occurred in June 2022 when investigators entered the suspect's DNA profile into public DNA databases, finding a match with a man named Richard Cottingham. Cottingham, already serving a life sentence in a New Jersey prison for taking the lives of multiple women, pleaded not guilty but faces 25 years to life in prison if convicted. Due to his poor health, he had to be arraigned in a hospital bed, wearing a patient's gown and a face mask. Nassau County District Attorney and Donnelly emphasized the significance of this case being possibly the oldest ever prosecuted based on DNA evidence. She warned against being deceived by Cottingham's frail appearance, emphasizing his past violence. Diane's daughter, Darlene Jean Altman, expressed her unexpected relief and gratitude for finally getting justice for her mother. Altman wore a necklace with a ballerina slipper charm that belonged to her mother, attending the arraignment and describing Cottingham's unsettling gaze. Detectives are now investigating other unsolved cases from 1967 to 1980 when Cottingham was active, revealing evidence that he was also present in Nassau County, according to Donnelly. That's it like this video and subscribe our channel.